To get started, I want to welcome you to tonight's presentation of the Pacific Crest Trail by sociology professor Richard Brinkman. This lecture is part of the new WBC Speaks Lecture Series. And at its heart, the lecture series aims to celebrate and explore the knowledge and passion in the Wenatchee Valley College academic community and share it with you, the larger community. We are all here this evening to celebrate Rich and his incredible 150-day journey. Rich is currently a sociology professor here at Wenatchee Valley College and has taught sociology at the college or university level since 1992. Prior to teaching full-time at Wenatchee Valley College, Rich served as the cities of Aberdeen, Wenatchee, and Leavenworth, the latter as city administrator. Both his bachelor's and master's degrees are in sociology from the University of Oregon and Iowa State University, respectively. And he served in the United States Peace Corps from 1990 to 1992 in Central America. Rich has served many years with charitable organizations, including the United Way and Red Cross, and performed comedy magic for many years benefiting such causes. Rich went on sabbatical in 2015 to hike the Pacific Crest Trail, fondly known as the PCT, from Mexico all the way to Canada, and is collaborating with Marshall University professor Dr. Christy Fondren on the study of long-distance hiking subcultures. Tonight, this talk will be illuminating, funny, and educational. You are in for a real treat. So please welcome me in welcoming Rich Brinkman. Thank you so much, Libby. Thank you all. It's always good to get the applause up front because you're never quite sure how the presentation is going to go. Uh, it's, it's a sincere honor and privilege uh, to be able to share my experience with you. Uh, here for the second time in a week here on the National Valley College campus. I'd also like to thank not only Lindsay as the main initial, who's been instrumental with the WBC Speak series and taking care of all the details to set these events up. Larry Baker uh, as well from our IT department here at the college, Gustavo and Maria, and uh, Brett also from IT uh, with the sound and the lighting. It, it really does take a, a team effort, and I'm very grateful. And speaking of gratitude, I have to express my, my sincere and deep gratitude to the entire college for the opportunity for a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It was a lifelong dream to hike the Pacific Crest Trail, and without the National Valley College, the Professional Development Committee, and the sabbatical process, I would never have been able uh, to have the five months to hike the PCP. So I just want to start up front with that gratitude. This is actually Glacier Peak from right in our own backyard. It's very easy to access the PCT. You can access it from Stevens Pass. Uh, you can also access it through Smithbrook to get a little bit closer uh, to the trail. And a uh, great day hike for those interested would be Lake Valhalla. If anybody's interested, I can certainly give you more details on that. This is from the north, uh, looking back on it, and one of my favorite uh, pictures from the entire track. The PCT is really a national treasure, 2,650 miles long. The asterisk is there is because once you reach Canada, you have to actually hike another eight miles to get to Manning Park and the road in order to get home. I did have to circumvent around uh, two major fires, and so I didn't hike uh, the entire mileage. Uh, but I was able to hike from Stevens Pass North, uh, which many hikers were not able to do this year, those that were ahead of me, uh, due to the very significant fires there. Uh, notorious up and down route, the PCT passes through four national monuments, six national parks, five state parks, 25 national forests, and 48 federal wilderness areas. This is a true national treasure. You can imagine uh, the preparation that goes into uh, such a five-month trip. California typically takes three months by itself, Oregon and Washington about a month each. And uh, I have to admit that my daughters uh, did a lot of that uh, packaging in the Ziploc bags. Our living room turned into my uh, staging area. Again, you can imagine the type of planning that goes into such a track. Uh, when I got to San Diego, I was picked up by a trail angel, someone who is very close to the trail uh, personally, maybe has hiked it before, but many of the trail angels are just really uh, fans of people who attempt this uh, five-month trek. And I was picked up by the airport. He took me to his home in San Diego. I stayed the night there. These three other hikers uh, were already at his, his house. 
He was getting up in the middle of the night to pick up others at the airport. And that next morning at 5 o'clock, he drove us uh, 50 minutes east of San Diego to the southern terminus of the Pacific Crest Trail. And you can see uh, that ball in the background indicates the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, from left to right, this, uh, he, this is Desert Hang, uh, Caesar, Stretch, and myself. Many good progress here, right? One mile, one mile in. Uh, this is actually the only sign of time on the entire PCT. It's a road mile sign. Uh, you don't see these on trail, but at mile one, there it was. Uh, after we reached uh, 20 miles that day, we got to Lake Marina, California, where the annual kickoff event is held. Uh, tragically, due to some logistical issues, it's not happening for the hikers this year, but it's happened every year for many years. They have workshops there. Uh, you have vendors there selling gear if you need a last minute item or, or decide to switch out a gear item. Uh, many legends of long distance hiking are there. This is Billy Goat. Billy Goat has hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, the Appalachian Trail, which is the equivalent on the Atlantic Coast, and the Continental Divide Trail all multiple times. In fact, uh, at the taking of this picture, he had 46,100 miles hiked on the long trails. Uh, that's about walking the circumference of the earth twice. Uh, this is Yogi. She is another legend of long distance hiking. If we have a little time to uh, how she got her trail name is, uh, is really quite funny. Um, and I'll share some of those details if we have uh, time at the end. But meeting these people, I mean, after researching the PCT for so many years, it was like I knew them. And they all thought I was crazy because I was treating them uh, like I knew them. Uh, so after a couple days of the kickoff, the, the journey really begins. It was a, a very overcast and kind of wet day, uh, which is very uncharacteristic for uh, the desert. And uh, uh, there were hurricane force winds in the forecast, which is always a nice thing to be walking into. A uh, very common occurrence when you get to a road crossing on trail to encounter trail magic. Uh, this gentleman right here is from San Diego, and he drove uh, here early in the morning put up an umbrella because uh, it, was, it was kind of a rainy day. You can see the cooler there. He had Gatorade in there, fresh fruit. Uh, this is not uncommon at low crossings. Not all low crossings, but perhaps one out of every five to eight low crossings. It's very common to have a trail angel that are helping out the hikers. Uh, always a little bit unsettling when uh, there's unexploded military ordnance in the area. Uh, this was where I decided to stop that first night after the kickoff. This was 18 miles that day. I was at 5,400 feet, and I, if I was going to keep going toward Mount Laguna, I would reach 5,900 feet. And with those heavy winds forecast, I decided to stay low. Very good decision to do so. Uh, the winds would come shortly after I had my tent set up. And the best way I can explain that night is lying on an airport runway and a jet landing right over you about every 30 seconds. Very rough night. Uh, the tent stood, uh, but a lot of the gear got very wet, so the next uh, day I got to Mount Laguna and was able to find a cabin and dry everything out. Uh, Indian paintbrush, constant companion along the trail. Now you can see more uh, common desert conditions. I've never been a desert hiker, and uh, California was in the fourth year of an exceptional drought. That's uh, a couple stages beyond severe drought. Uh, so it wasn't uh, uncommon to go 15, even 20 miles in between water sources. Uh, very, very hot. Uh, hikers do this. They make these signs in the trail. Uh, always very encouraging to come up upon a mile mark marker like that. Uh, here's, again, trail angels uh, putting a water cache here. Uh, you can see what the water quality would be like if uh, the trail angels weren't doing that, especially these last couple of years in Southern California. Uh, this was the first hot day in the desert after a couple of cool days. And at the, I, actually this morning, I taped uh, my big toes and my little toes to prevent blistering because I knew it was going to be hot. And ironically, at the end of this day, uh, it was the toes that I taped that actually had marble-sized blisters. And so uh, I continued to take my heels, but not, not my toes. And I, of course, took the tape off, I danced the blisters, uh, treated them, and dressed them. But the next morning when I got back uh, to the trail, I saw a sign on the road that said Warner Springs 20 miles. Now, um, no one knew this. No, none of my fellow hikers knew this. But during the week up in Leavenworth, where I live, uh, for the last eight years or so, I've been training for the PCT. And on weekends, I have time to go to the trail and hike the Icicle Ridge Trail or the equivalent. But 
during the week, because I, you know, I cook dinner and have other obligations, I would put on a 50 pound training pack and walk the three miles ski hill loop up in Leavenworth. So I had done a lot of road walking, and I figured that the road uh, this morning would be much easier on my feet and the blisters than a rough trail with rocks and rattlesnakes. So I decided to take the road the 20 miles up to Warner Springs. And about four miles into that roadblock, a car, I'm facing the traffic, and a car slows down and pulls over. Uh, and this turns out to be Warner Springs Monty, another legend of long distance hiking. And this is the Centra. She actually lives in Plain, 15 miles from where I live, but we had never met before. And they, they were taking trail magic to Sisters Crossing when I started the roadblock. And they gave me hot dogs out of the back of the truck and watermelon, uh, trail magic there on the side of the road. And uh, Monty told me that I could, at 14 miles of the roadblock, take a side road and get back on the PCT to see Eagle Rock, which is one of the major landmarks in Southern California. And I took him up on that offer because right at that road crossing is Barrel Spring, just a little bit to the south. So when I got to Barrel Spring, I was hiking the wrong way, and there were other hikers there at Barrel Spring asking me, are you hiking the trail south? I said no. And I told them the story, and from that moment forward, I was a walker. Trail names are a very, very important part of the experience. Yes, they are a lot of fun. Many of them are hilarious, and I'll tell you some stories uh, toward the end. Okay, but they're also very, very significant. It actually becomes uh, somewhat of an insult when you introduce yourself via your trail name, and someone says, well, what's your real name? Uh, because the trail name becomes so much a part of your new identity, your identity of a through hiker. You left your old identity behind when you're hiking the trail. Uh, so here's Eagle Rock uh, with the guy I was hiking with. He was actually from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, this is at Warner Springs. This is the first major resupply. And when I got to the post office, I had five boxes. Okay, And this is the one that was supposed to be there. But uh, encouraging family members and friends decided that I could probably use something. And you can tell that there's absolutely no way that I was going to be able to carry this on trail. Uh, but one thing these towns have is hiker boxes. So anything that you have that you don't need, you put in the hiker boxes to help the other hikers out, because they certainly can be. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is a, actually a marking in the uh, trail that I made indicating water because it was very difficult to find this tank. Uh, desert conditions, again, I wasn't a big fan of the desert. Uh, another water cache uh, from Trail Angels. And uh, actually, just north of, or just south of Idlewild, the, the PCT was closed due to a bad fire the previous year. So we had to circle that around and get back on the PCT at South Junction via the Devil's Slide Trail. Uh, here you can see we're up on Mount San Jacinto and headed toward Fuller Ridge. Uh, here we're on the top of Fuller Ridge, and even though we're getting a brief reprieve from the <laughs> desert, you can see we're about to go right back down to the desert floor. Uh, this is uh, Trail Angel Ziggy and the Bears. You can see that they completely put carpeting down in their backyard and uh, these, these uh, shelters, temporary shelters. And you can see, it's, this is very early in the morning, I got very early stars, but you can see some hikers are, are still uh, sleeping. This used to be all riverbed. All that you see here, all of this white used to be riverbed, and it's just been reduced to this tiny trickle, and this next slide shows a close-up of that. But again, water very, very scarce in Southern California. Here I'm trying to make the cover of backpacking, but the uh, light didn't quite work out as well as I would like. And here's another great example of hikers looking out for each other. Okay, so the hikers ahead made this sign, uh, if you, it's hard to see, warning, poodle dog bush, and an arrow pointing right at uh, this plant, which is supposed to be far more toxic than poison oak. Uh, fortunately, I didn't get to test that hypothesis. Uh, this is Coon Creek Cabin. Uh, something seemingly magic happened on the trail every day. Uh, here it's about to snow, and I reach this cabin, find my little uh, place in a corner. I uh, had the terrible idea of putting my sleeping bag inside that emergency bivy there. It uh, created condensation, and I woke up and I had ice actually on my down sleeping bag. Uh, but you can see that the next morning it actually it did snow. Uh, this is Big Bear City, always very encouraging when you see the welcoming, you know, of the PCT hikers. Idlewild had a big banner, welcome, PCT hikers, 
Uh, just, just very, very uh, special to see that. Uh, this is Roadrunner. This was a great day on trail. This is a very strong 20 mile day for me. When she learned that my name was Road Blocker, well, Roadrunner had to take a picture with me. Uh, great day. That was a wonderful, strong 20 mile day on trail. Again, hikers looking out for uh, those that are behind them. Uh, indicated here the rattlesnake. Here's another water cache. Notice that this one also includes garbage. That may not sound like much of a luxury, right? But we're all very strong with me, no trace principles. And so when you have the opportunity to unload your garbage, that is a really nice thing to be able to do. Uh, this is Frosty, another fellow hiker. You can see we still got uh, almost 2,300 miles to go on trail. This is now Wrightwood, uh, California. And when you take a day off in town, uh, obviously the shower is very important, laundry, uh, resupplying, getting organized, figuring out what your next five days are going to look like. Uh, here you can see the poodle dog bush that's entirely across the trail. And this is a pretty steep embankment on this side. And so you just end up, end up getting uh, pricked by you know, whatever the other bush is, but you certainly don't want to touch that. You don't even have to touch it to get a reaction. Even uh, trail maintenance crews that are working around it wear really strong protective clothing and uh, for the respiratory system as well. Uh, here you can see the trail. This is just south of Agua Dulce, California. Another trail agent is the Andersons. I had my little place in their backyard where I was able to pitch my tent, but even though everybody's got their tent pitched in their backyard somewhere, everybody's congregated uh, at the front porch area and uh, they serve dinner every night. Uh, it's, it's all by donation. Uh, here's Terry Anderson. All the hikers you can see over the years have signed uh, the bed sheet that they have hanging out. This is her husband, Joe. Every morning he puts pancakes for all the hikers that are staying there. And keep in mind, for about a month and a half period, they've got about 30 to 40 hikers a night uh, that are staying there. The PCT has become increasingly popular, especially with the wild effect, the movie Wild that came out uh, just prior to the year I hiked. A lot of wind farms in California. Here's my first change out of shoes. I was using Pocus to start the trail. I'm switching to clown shoes here. You can see the size of the, the toe box. I love the padding on the Hoka, uh, but you can see the toe box is actually quite narrow. So I decided to go with these ultra long peaks and a much wider toe box. My toes loved them. Uh, they were uh, uh, harsh on my Achilles, uh, but I was able to get through the Sierra with them. Uh, Joshua Trees. One fourth of the way. Uh, here is a spring, right? But if you can see that, it says water not safe to drink for drinking. Um, I, this was about five miles into the day's hike. I had enough water. Uh, I decided I was going to press on to the next water source in 50 miles, but I was really gambling, uh, really hoping that that next water source uh, would have water. And when I got there, it was just this little trickle uh, right here, uh, 15 miles later. Uh, thank goodness that was there. Rattlesnake, uh, what made this encounter interesting is, is that the trail comes like this, and so I was walking this way, and uh, that snake could have easily just taken a real shot at my lower leg. Uh, but uh, both my, I only had two rattlesnake encounters, which was pretty phenomenal, and uh, both were very courteous. 700 mile mark, this is a major milestone of the PCT because it marks Kennedy Meadows. Uh, this marks the end of the desert. Yay. Okay, and the beginning of the Sierra. Uh, so many hikers spend a couple of days here uh, celebrating, telling stories, and so forth, uh, catching their wind for a uh, major session of the High Sierra. Uh, I spent one night there, but I uh, got out uh, by the next afternoon. It's very easy to fall into the vortex when you're in town or when you're at a place like Kennedy Meadows and, and stay much longer than you should. And so there was always kind of this this pressure to, to, to just keep moving. These were actually three hikers that came from uh, South Korea. Sparkle on the far right there uh, actually had to quit the trail uh, shortly after this. Notice they're the ones drinking the beer right after that beer. Okay. okay. Uh, getting into the Sierra was, was absolutely wonderful. I can't tell you how welcome it was to be back in the kind of country that I had been used to backpacking in my entire life. Uh, Mount Whitney, uh, many people took a side trip to Summit Whitney, in fact, most hikers do. It's a 60 mile side trip. It's eight miles off trail to Summit, eight miles back. I decided I was going to save every step I possibly could to get to Canada. Uh, this is Chicken Spring Lake. 
Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park, uh, absolutely incredible country uh, there in the Sierra. This is now approaching Forester Pass, which is the highest point on the entire PCT. This is the actual pass up here. Uh, the trail kind of zigzags and lines. I'll show you that. This is looking back, you can see. Uh, this is late May, uh, toward the end of May, maybe even June 1st, about this time of year, you can see the lakes are still frozen. Uh, if you look very, very closely, this is getting up to the summit of the Forester Pass. There are four hikers uh, in front of me, a couple of switchbacks ahead. This is looking up at the cornice of Forester Pass. And then uh, there I am at uh, the summit, 13,200 feet, that's 2,000 feet higher than Mount Hood in northern Oregon. Uh, going down the other side, and you can see the lakes are still all frozen. But again, it's absolutely beautiful country in the High Sierra, the Muir Wilderness. Yeah, just beautiful country. Uh, this pass was actually quite uh, sketchy. I was carrying an ice axe that was mounted to the top of my trekking pole. I decided to do that rather than carrying an ice axe separately because I hate to stop. When I'm hiking, I do not like to stop and take off my pack. Uh, so having the ice axe in my hand the entire time was something that I thought was of great value. I was also carrying uh, trail crampons. Uh, that I uh, put on for uh, getting over this pass. You can see if you if you fall here and you can't self-arrest with the ice axe, the only thing that's going to stop you is a rock. Uh, so I'm very happy to be on top. Again, beautiful country in the Sierra. Uh, these uh, frequent just cascading waterfalls down these slabs of granite were very common. Water, you know, was so scarce during the, the desert the first 700 miles. Now water is absolutely everywhere. Uh, this is getting down close to Muir Pass. I believe that's Wanda Lake. You can see it's still half frozen. Uh, and navigation becomes a factor here too, because where, where is the trail? Uh, so navigation uh, in the snow, not to mention the post tolling. And this was a low snow year, but there was still a lot of snow on some of the passes. And it would be very frustrating with the post hole, meaning that you would sink in the snow up to your head because you're already tired. And then getting yourself out of that uh, was very strenuous. Uh, coming down the other side of Muir Pass, this is the north side. Uh, you can see that the lakes thaw from the shore out toward the center. And just look at the absolute pristine quality of that water. Uh, you didn't have to filter that. I, I still filter everything, but uh, you would be pretty safe there. Yeah, amazing country in the Sierra. This was the first major stream ford. Uh, there were a lot of floors, but nothing like this where you actually had to take your pants off if you didn't want to get them wet. Again, water very abundant. The trail through the Sierra is actually quite rough. Uh, this is the trail right here. And you can see these steps, uh, sometimes as much as two and a half, even three feet high. Uh, this was an early morning a stream forward. Again, uh, taking the shoes and the socks off, that takes time. I don't like stopping. So I started looking for these logs uh, to, to cross from this. This one was a pretty thin one, uh, but I did make it across without falling in. Nice campsite right there next to the stream. I always seem to get to the best campsites when it was too early to stop for the day. Uh, cairns are a very important part of the trail as well as trail markers, especially in the snow. Uh, this one in particular was mostly hiker art. Uh, one third of the way through the trail at this point. Uh, this is approaching Silver Pass and Silver Pass Lake. <coughs> And you can see uh, many of the lakes are still frozen, water being abundant, Ansel Adams Wilderness. Uh, this is actually in Mammoth, uh, California. These three uh, are through hikers like myself. We met the night before. Uh, this was someone who was from Yosemite, but who was uh, just spending the weekend in Mammoth, and we met her, and she just decided to hang out with us. I actually, as part of the research, interviewed the three of them. This is Phoenix, Lebowski, and Beetlejuice. And I uh, interviewed them actually right at that table. And uh, here we are going out to dinner afterward. Uh, hiker hunger is something that kicks in after about three weeks on trail. And you can go through a huge meal like we just did here, and the uh, server comes over ready to give you your check, and you're ready to order again. I mean, it is really uh, a fact to see when I share some of the research with you. One of the qualities of long distance hikers is excessive food consumption. Uh, you're supposed to maintain five, six thousand calories a day for this year, and it's very, very difficult to do that because bear cancer is required, and you can't get that much food in. 
Uh, so there's no way we would need that, that kind of calorie requirement. Uh, I had lost so much weight in the early going that I cut up my sleeping pad uh, to bolster my hip belt because it was not fitting anymore. Uh, so in that, I, I decided to uh, break down and get a new pack. Uh, that's what my pack is, or my hip belt was doing to my hips because it wasn't fitting right. Uh, this is Devil's Pulse Pile. Uh, this is now getting close to Yosemite. This is Banner Peak and Thousand Island Lake. Uh, here we are in Yosemite, plenty of waterfalls. Uh, Yosemite was actually, one of, aside from the desert, one of my least favorite sections of the trail. It was very rough. Uh, there was this crippling cobblestone uh, on the switchbacks. It was constantly up and down. It wasn't uh, a press trail through there. It didn't go near El Capitan or Half Dome. A uh, very, very challenging part of the trail. I wrote in my journal one night, what was like that the PCT to Yosemite was trying to get hikers to quit. Uh, volunteer Peak, again trying to make a cover of Backpacker, but lighting just not quite right. This is uh, sunrise the next morning, beautiful mid-morning reflection, Yosemite. And again, you can see the, the trail is just very, very rough. And you know, you're about mile 1,000 at this point, and so you're starting to have foot issues, ankle issues, and so uh, that roughness of trail was very really difficult. Uh, Dorothy Lake, here we have the 1,000 mile marker, another major milestone. Uh, this is now getting close to Sonora Pass. And if you look closely, you can see the trail here uh, winding through and just this sheer drop off on uh, the other side. Uh, I was not expecting to encounter much snow at Sonora Pass. I had already sent the trail grandpa's home at Kalani Meadows. Uh, but fortunately, I still had the uh, hiking pole with the ice axe down to the top. Uh, you can see this is what I had to traverse here. Uh, and you can see if you fall, you're going to fall a long way. Uh, this gives you an idea of the steepness of it. Uh, it's very hard to see, but you can see the trail kind of comes through and pushes through this little notch right here. Again, getting very close to Sonora Pass, the sun is starting to set. And uh, lo and behold, I hadn't seen them for uh, over 200 miles, but when we encountered the fire and trail closure near Northfieldville, California, uh, I had to take uh, transit from Bridgeport, had to issue Bridgeport, and then take transit up to Carson City, uh, Nevada. And as I got to the little bus stop, look, it's Lebowski, Beetlejuice, Phoenix, and this is Lomel. And uh, they were the ones that I had a magical night with in Mammoth. Uh, once we got to Carson City, Nevada, we had to hitch the South Lake Tahoe to get back onto the trail at Echo Lake. It's about a 45 mile hitch, and here we are in the back of a pickup truck, which probably isn't even legal in California. It certainly wouldn't be legal here. Uh, when I got to Echo Lake, I had my third uh, pair of shoes change out. I went from the you know, very large tow box to a more uh, traditional trail runner. These are Brooks Cascadia 10s, and they proved to be uh, the real shoe for me. Everybody's feet are different, you know, so someone can have a really strong recommendation for a particular shoe, uh, but whether it works for you or not uh, can be questionable. Uh, Susie Lake, Deer Lake, uh, this is a tree spring. You can see it's coming out of this, this trough. Uh, that was some of the best water on the entire PCT. Uh, this is, as I climbed out of the Feather River, uh, we dropped down to about 2,000 feet, the lowest elevation we've been since the desert. And now we're climbing up to about 6,000 feet, just all, all day uphill. And I got to the sign, Trail Angels, invite you to our cabin, showers, laundry, food, mattresses, internet. Give us a call, you'll have service right ahead at Lookout Rock. And sure enough, I get to Lookout Rock a couple hundred yards beyond, check my phone, I have service, I call the number, and they drive out to the next road crossing and pick me up, take me to their home. There was a, it was July 3rd, and they had plans on the fourth. Cook a huge barbecue rib dinner. I mean, just absolutely unbelievable. And these were the other hikers that were there with me that night. This is uh, Puzzler, Ava, and Nola. Again, very common to see coolers uh, from Trail Angels. Uh, often they're not there personally, but they left the fruit, the Gatorade, and so forth uh, in the cooler for the through hikers. Uh, this here is Cool Whip Avenger Cowboy Bonus Miles and Steady, uh, now in Belden, California, and I interviewed uh, all of them right there at that table that night. Uh, anytime you can 
air out the socks is a good idea. Here's my water system. Uh, these are the reservoirs here, and this was the actual filter I used. There is no comparison. The Sawyer filter, even if you're going on a weekend backpack trip, I would highly recommend it. It's not that expensive. Uh, you can get the mini version. I wouldn't go that route. I would just get the regular version. It was a little more heavy, uh, but it was very, very reliable. I think, I mean, you could easily use one filter the entire uh, PCT. I decided to change it out midway through. Uh, this was a very powerful spring, full spring. Uh, this is at the halfway marker. Uh, Cougar and Touche, this is near Lassen National Volcanic Monument. They, they built these boardwalks and they emphasize that you stay on them because of all the geothermal activity. You could actually break through the crust and fall into magma. Um, so it was a good idea to stay on the boardwalks. This is boiling lake. And you can see the steam coming up from it. It is actually literally uh, boiling. Uh, for this Mount Lassen. Mount Lassen collapsed on itself, much like Mount Mazama that created Crater Lake. So Mount Mazama actually used to be more like this. Or this is uh, Lassen, Mount Lassen. Used to be very massive, uh, but it lost its mass and eruption. Again, hikers looking out for other hikers. You get to these uh, kind of road crossings, very primitive road here. You don't know where the, the trail rejoins. And so uh, it's very nice that, that hikers do that for each other. Okay, things are starting to look a little bit better, folks, right? 12.33 to go. Uh, this is Bernie Falls, uh, down in Northern California. Uh, Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta a couple minutes later. Uh, you've heard that mountains create their own weather. I'm not kidding. This, these pictures were taken uh, within just a few minutes of each other. Uh, this is Dutch Claire over here on the right. She got injured. Uh, and rather than just staying in town, she actually uh, was able to raise some money online, buy a bunch of food and drink, and she came out to the trail and just set up camp for a couple days just so she could rest her injury, and she's provided trail magic uh, for those that are passing. Uh, Shasta again from a different angle, about 1,500. You can see the feet are starting to take quite a beating here, uh, especially this toe is really starting to suffer at mile 1500, Castle Crags Wilderness. Uh, here on, on camp, you can see the weather is very unsettled here. This is getting close to Edna, California, in Northern California. And uh, the afternoon thunderstorms were very, very severe. And so I called it a day here and tried to get under the tree for the inevitable downpour that was ensuing. There were some day hikers that were nearby and uh, they came over and gave me all of this food that they had uh, packed in for themselves. Uh, something like magic like that would happen every single day on the PCT. Uh, here's hail accompanying those afternoon thunderstorms. You can see that's that's good size, good size hail. Uh, Marble Mountains Wilderness trail registers are how uh, we really keep a great line on the trail. Who's ahead? Who's behind? Uh, sending messages to people you haven't seen uh, for a while that you know are a day or two behind you. Uh, this is this is all marble, uh, and some of the real rare green marble found its way into my pocket somehow. I'm not sure how that happened, but I had to bring some home for my daughters. Uh, bridge wash offs on the report. This was the first gear failure, and uh, most hikers don't carry duct tape. I carry a small amount of duct tape, even though I'm an extra weight. I was very, very glad I had it because that uh, simple wrap job uh, was sufficient uh, to keep going on trail. Uh, Fern Spring, uh, it's estimated between five and 10,000 trees fall across the PCT in any given year. Hey, you're tired, you're hurting, uh, getting over these uh, trees, but the, the trail crews do, do a tremendous job. Uh, you know, this, this, this is a, an example of a trail marker uh, that we see on trees, and someone creatively said, "Black Californians, we're getting close. Here's the Oregon border. Uh, there's myself at the Oregon border. Uh, here's a spring. Notice how hikers have put this leaf here and anchored it with these rocks, so that you have a nice flow. Uh, if if that leaf wasn't there, it would be very difficult to fill your reservoir. In fact, I, I carried a little pill vial in the, for those situations where I could." fill the vial and then pour it into the reservoir. But that takes a significant time to do. And so it's always nice when the hikers are, are doing this for those of us to follow. 
1,700 miles. Uh, I love these shoes, but you can see it didn't take very long for them to start uh, coming apart. Uh, getting rid of some gear at Ashman, uh, you can see this water bottle had these black spots growing in it, uh, but I, I couldn't change them out until I got to Ashland. And my feet just really ballooned when I was in Ashland. I ended up taking an additional zero day, meaning zero miles, a complete day off, and I iced all day trying to get the swelling to go down, and it just simply did not go down. One thing we learn on trail is that the way, the way you solve problems is to just keep walking. And whether you're in pain or not, you just keep walking, and that seems to solve everything. Once I started back on trail, my swelling went down. Uh, here you can see again the hikers looking out for each other. Uh, in Oregon, I maybe had four or five days that were not smoke-filled due to a very bad wildfire season in Oregon. Uh, this is one of four cooked meals I had on the PCT. Uh, my stove was banned in California because of the exceptional drought. Uh, so when I got to Oregon, I started to use my stove. And four days later, the state of Oregon banned my stove. So I was actually cookless all but four nights on the entire PCT. Uh, again, uh, you can see the smoke. Here you see the devastation from uh, previous wildfires. Uh, this is Devil's Peak. If you look closely, this is the trail here. Uh, just coming out of this notch and approaching Crater Lake, another major obstacle uh, to get around. Again, devastation from previous wildfire. And uh, when I got to Crater Lake, uh, actually when I got to Ashland, I had uh, shoes sent to me specifically for the lava in Oregon. I wanted a sturdier shoe with a heavier sole, but my feet had swelled up so much that the shoes didn't fit anymore. They were too small. So I had to walk in the two small shoes from Ashland to Crater Lake, it was about 100 miles. Uh, so I was very happy to reach this spot, get those resupply boxes, and my sister sent emergency shoes there. Uh, here's Crater Lake. Yeah, this is from the rim, of course, Wizard Island. Uh, you can see that I'm about four or 500 feet actually above the lake, up on the rim. Uh, this is my favorite shot of Crater Lake that I have. Uh, this next one, it looks like you can touch the water, but I'm, again, about four or 500 feet above uh, the water at this point. You can see here the tops of trees and I'm well above them. Uh, water cache. Uh, this is looking back on Crater Lake. Okay, so Mount Mazama used to be you know, like that. And, and uh, during the eruption, it completely collapses on itself. Mount Pielsen. Uh, this is actually pumice, volcanic rock, uh, lining the trail on both sides. Mount Pielsen, this was uh, one of my favorite lunch spots of the entire trail. You can see Pielsen Creek coming through here. Uh, great campsite, yeah, it's again too early to stop for the day. Uh, this is Six Horse Spring. This was the last water for over 17 miles. The problem with this spring was that it was about a half mile off trail and down a steep uh, a mountainside. And when you got down there, here's the spring, this, this little trick from the beginning, you can see the hikers previously had put the leaf there. Uh, this is Odell Lake at Shelter Cove, where I also resupplied. Uh, here entering the Three Sister Wilderness, I was in a big hurry because the professor from Marshall University that I collaborated with flew out with her husband from West Virginia to meet me on the Pacific Crest Trail. And uh, because they hadn't been hiking, and I had been hiking since Mexico, they decided they'd better start several days ahead of me. Uh, but I'm rushing at this point to try and catch up with them. This is one of the old uh, PCT markers from when Congress dedicated the trail in 1968. Uh, very few of them uh, still exist, but even north of Stevens Pass, there are a couple uh, that are still on the trees. And look who I run into here in the Three Sisters Wilderness of Billigo. He was hiking from uh, Timberline Lodge down in Castle Crest, California uh, this year, and after he finished that, 46,100 miles. Uh, here's Dr. Farnham on the left and myself. I met her uh, in the Three Sisters Wilderness area, finally caught up with her at Dumbbell Lake. Uh, she was there with her husband. We had a great evening uh, talking about our research and the project and sociology. Uh, she's one of the most wonderful people uh, I've ever worked with. Uh, this is the first uh, site of the South Sister now. And as I get closer to it, here you see the middle sister uh, emerging behind it. It was about right at this point that I developed a very serious injury. And I, at first, I didn't know what it was. It was broken bones and pain in my shin. And I didn't know if it was a stress fracture. I'd broken several bones in my life previously, so I know what that kind of pain felt like. Uh, but I'm 
literally limping uh, at this point and starting to question what it is. It turned out to just be a severe shin splint. But the way that you cure a severe shin splint is to stop hiking. Uh, I'd be a terrible doctor. Uh, just keep going, just keep going. And uh, I did. And uh, by the time I got to Mount Hood, it finally subsided. But that was 150 miles with a severe shin splint. Uh, you can see very interesting erosion patterns on the south sister here, uh, the middle sister. I'm actually camped right in between both mountains. This is one of my favorite campsites uh, on the trail. And you can see my tent's in the same location there. It's just in between the two mountains. Uh, sunrise over the middle sister the next morning. This is Obsidian Falls. Uh, and you can see now I'm going to be getting into the lava, which is the worst kind of trail condition for a severe shin splint. Uh, very rough trail. You can see the trail down here and then winding its way uh, up the lava. Uh, this is the North Sister now, looking back at the Middle Sister. This is looking forward, a little blurry, but this is Mount Washington, Three Finger Jack, and Mount Jefferson. And you can see it's very rough uh, making it through the lava. Uh, interestingly, these two little areas, little like islands in the sea of lava, uh, were spared. Uh, this is a church camp, a uh, big lake youth camp, and they allow hikers to send boxes there for your resupply, and again, it was nice to see uh, the welcome sign. I stayed uh, the night there right next to the lake. Uh, next day, uh, and this is, I, mean, I was asked last Thursday when I was giving this presentation, uh, if I ever had thoughts of quitting the trail, and, you know, when you think about something like this, your, almost your entire life, you've got just so much power uh, to finish. But with the injury as it was, I was questioning whether I was going to be able to finish. I was at least going to get to Washington. And if I had to uh, call it a hike at that point, uh, I would have arrived. Um, but fortunately, by the time I got to Crossing Mount Hood, miraculously, uh, the shins went my way. Uh, this would be Three Finger Jack if the clouds weren't there, but once I got to the south, uh, it lifted enough just to get a picture. Uh, here are 2,000 miles, so about 650 to go. That's the first view of Mount Jefferson. Uh, as the weather clears up even more, a uh, beautiful mountain, very uh, special to me because uh, much of my youth backpacking is around Mount Jefferson here on camp right underneath it. Now I've uh, come around, and this is actually from the north, looking back on the mountain, you can see smoke starting to roll in again. Russell Lake, again, very rough trail in many of the areas. <laughs> this is now at the Lolly Lake, where I, I got there early. I started taking zero days instead of zero days. Zero days are just, after you take a zero day, once you get on trail the next morning, it, it felt like I had not been on trail for years. It was a very strange feeling. And so what I did instead, was that I would time this so that I could hike maybe five or ten miles in the morning, and I started every morning at six, and then I could take the afternoon off, right? So near zero day, but not an actual zero day. Uh, this is Dundee and Raccoon and Bones. Uh, when these two guys were together, they were known as the Doobie Brothers uh, for very good reason. <laughs> okay, here I got a cabin. Yeah, I got, I, so I did a cabin here at Olali Lake. And anytime you get a chance to rinse out your clothes, uh, you're doing that. You can see here I'm icing uh, the shin as much as I can. And the feet at this point are really uh, taking a beating. Uh, I, I carry more water than most hikers did. I carry close to three liters on me, actually about 2.7. Uh, that enabled me to skip water sources like this, which you can see are, are not very attractive. Uh, here I am. You know, just sometimes you, you camp on a little abandoned dirt road. Uh, this is a little crater lake. Uh, you can see this is all underwater, but there's this shelf, and then there's this very dramatic drop off. Uh, first view of Mount Hood, and you can see the smoke. And in fact, here's a wildfire right here. Here's Highway 26 connecting Portland to Mount Hood and wildfire in the area. Uh, this was a very difficult traverse. Uh, if you can see, that's just deep sand. It's like walking on a treadmill. Uh, Timberline Lodge, and Timberline Lodge meant the best meal on the entire PCT. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, happy to say that I limited the number of falls to five. Uh, this was one of them. This was the Sandy River crossing. It was actually a very dangerous crossing. Ramona Falls. 
Uh, this crossing, you lock on this log, but because this log is on top of it, your center of gravity would make you fall. So someone uh, put this rope here so you could hold on to it as you're crossing. This is looking back on Mount Hood now from the north. And when I got to Lobo Pass, just a few miles beyond where the last picture was taken, I went into Dundee again. His friend Brent drove out from Spokane okay, and provided trail magic for any of us that happened along that night. And if it was one night on the PCT that was most memorable, uh, this was it. We were joined uh, by Phoenix here, Rigo, and Franco. And uh, that was just one, one incredible night. Again, the most memorable night on the entire PCT and truly uh, what the Pacific Crest Trail is all about and what the research is all about. These very close-knit family kinds of bonds, strong emotional bonds that develop among complete strangers. Uh, sunset on Mount Hood. If you can see the outline of Mount Hood here, okay, watch what happens the next morning. Uh, hopefully you can see it, but can you see that outline? The, the smoke from the Mount Adams fire had rolled in overnight uh, and just completely taken over. Uh, this is actually an alternate route. This is the Eagle Creek Trail that I would say 99% of PCT through hikers take. We get off the PCT uh, because this trail offers some amazing scenery, including Tunnel Falls. You can see this is the trail here that's actually going to go uh, behind the waterfall. Yeah, that's Tunnel Falls. Uh, then getting to the Oregon-Washington border. This is Phoenix and Franco again. We're about to cross the Bridge of the Gods. Uh, you can see there's no real lane for pedestrians here. Uh, so, and this steel great. I mean, looking down at the, I mean, I, I couldn't wait to get across the bridge. Again, you can see the very heavy smoke uh, from the Mount Adams fire. Uh, at that time, the fires here, steam gas to the north, were so significant uh, that the warnings on the PCT listserv were don't, you know, don't do it. Uh, call it good at Stevens Pass, people. The risk is too great. And for those hikers that were ahead of me on trail, who started earlier or were just hiking at a much faster pace, they stopped at Stevens Pass, waited for, you know, a few days, maybe even a week. But that gets really expensive for a through hiker when you're having to spend uh, money to stay in a motel. Uh, so for many hikers, the trail was used to end the Stevens Pass. Uh, this is a very common scene. Uh, this is liability. Uh, I'll have to tell you the story behind this trail name as well. Uh, this is square. Uh, this is a very common scene. We're all here at White Pass now waiting for a box to come in the mail. Uh, first view of Mount Rainier. Uh, when I got to Chinook Pass, again, uh, trail magic uh, being provided. And my friend Jeff actually drove out, and he thought since we were right underneath Mount Rainier, it would be appropriate to have Rainier here. And I have to, I have to share something else. It probably was very strange having a box like this here. But this actually came to me at the college today. Some very nice folks here at the college decided to send me something while I was on trail. But they sent it to Cascade Locks, which was one of the post offices that I did not plan to resupply it at. So it, it sat in the Cascade Locks post office for all this time, and then they finally returned to sender. And I opened it up today to <laughs> see this. This is at Chinook Pass, okay? So, uh, just, the, I just can't overemphasize how magical things like that seem to happen almost every day on the trail. Uh, as an example, there was one a person that needed a safety pin really bad because they lost the button on their pants, and an hour later, in the middle of the trail, there was a safety pin. I mean, it, 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 something like that seemingly happened every day. Uh, this is a trail magic at uh, Stampede Pass. And she had chili, uh, all the fixings, sour cream. I mean, it's, it's just phenomenal what these people do. And of course, I'm going to be uh, providing trail magic at Stevens Pass uh, throughout the hiking season this coming PCT year. Uh, a lot of clear cutting uh, through this section of the trail as I'm getting close to Snoqualmie Pass now. 
Uh, this is when we got that really heavy rain, just a week solid of rain. My desert umbrella uh, finally came in handy, uh, but for the rain, right, not to protect against the sun. Uh, this is Mirror Lake. Uh, I don't know what my message is here. Hikers, wear bright clothing and make your presence known so you don't get shot. Uh, this is Recon. Uh, when I got to Stevens Pass, look who we're reunited with. Beetlejuice, Lebowski, Phoenix. This is something Hawaiian. She's actually from Hawaii, and she had an official Hawaiian name, but no one could remember it. So whenever they talked with her, it was, gosh, I forget your name, but I know it was something Hawaiian. So she became something Hawaiian. Uh, <laughs> I knew I was taking it out to breakfast at Crystal's in Leavenworth, and this is when we were all at Stevens Pass. And uh, I drove them uh, all back to the trail afterward. I stayed uh, home in Leavenworth for another day. Uh, this is uh, after Grizzly Peak. Now getting close to... Uh, this was a very wet day. This kind of just wet drizzle soaked you to the bone before you can get you. This is Red's Pass. Uh, this is Smoky. I had not seen Smoky. So we're at Glacier Peak, almost mile 2400. And I had not seen Smoky since Chester, California, which was about 1300 miles ago. Uh, so we had quite a reunion there. Uh, I'm standing on the new bridge. This is the old bridge. Uh, again, what do you do when you encounter a situation like this? You walk down one side and up the other. Uh, very similar to the opening shot I showed you. This is actually looking back on Glacier Peak. Uh, I just was lucky to have a very nice day here after all of that rain. Uh, that's fall number five. Again, you know, you get to this point, and there's a trail going this way, and a trail going this way, and then you notice the PCT because of the previous hikers, and you can see the North Cascades now in the distance. Uh, this was a tremendous campsite up on this ridge. Uh, I'm at a lake uh, called Mika Lake, and that's Mika Lake sunrise in the morning. Uh, here, the trail is completely washed out. Here's the end of the trail, and I'm on the trail, but this, this whole section just completely washed out. So I actually had to circle back and then uh, bushwhack my way back to the, uh, the trail. Uh, trail will not be tamed on this plane because of those fires. This section of the trail had been closed the entire season, just reopened, so the crews hadn't had any opportunity to get out uh, to try and clear any of the trees. So uh, very rough going around Glacier Peak. This one you had to go under, uh, which requires some creativity. This is the Seattle River. Uh, here are those signs of the trail being closed previously. Again, now approaching North Cascades. Uh, you know, trail making slacking a bit there. This is Face and Super Classy. Face here had previously hiked the Appalachian Trail, and he had a beard when he hiked it, so his trail name was Face Jacket. But now that he's uh, going clean shaven, well, at least mostly, he just became Face. Uh, this is uh, the crunching Sahican. Anyone been to the bakery in Sahican? Yeah, uh, you know, it's crazy. I never ate sweets. I was a college wrestler at the University of Oregon. Just have never eaten sweets my entire life. On trail, that was very different. One of my favorite things to do was eat candy at the evening. And certainly, I indulged here at the Sahican Bakery. Uh, entering North Cascades National Park. Uh, you can see I had to switch out my tent. Uh, uh, luckily, I had uh, two of the same tent. But my tent pole right before Stahican uh, broke so significantly that the duct tape would, just wasn't holding. And so uh, I had to come home and get a new tent. Uh, this is Rainy Lake. You can see the weather really starting to change now in September with, uh, with crushed snow. And I've got to kind of hustle uh, to get to that Canadian border. And there we are. That's the northern terminus of the trail. Uh, they made me climb it. I wasn't going to, but I'm glad I, I did. Uh, so welcome to Canada. One last rock sign uh, to celebrate the completion of the through hike. Here getting to Manning Park, British Columbia. Always a bit unsettling, you know what that all means, right? That's uh, Grizzlies in the area. Uh, this is Spaniard, he was actually from Spain. Uh, we had quite a magical evening that night. I was very lucky to finish the trail with Beetlejuice, Phoenix, Lebowski. Three people that you know I have run into periodically throughout the entire hike. Uh, there we are at water. Smokey made it in later that night, uh, so it was really magical who I was able to, to complete the trail with. Something the lion uh, came in later that night. And then of course getting home and uh, reuniting with my two daughters. 
who uh, immediately got the clippers out to uh, get out of that beer. Yeah. And they did. So I'd like to just share a, a few things with you in terms of what was most memorable, what was most scary, and then share a few things about the research. I uh, think we're doing okay on time. Uh, but uh, just, just briefly, I'd like to share a few of the, the highlights or scariest moments, most memorable things. Uh, entering the Sierra, as I mentioned, that night in Mammoth, uh, meeting uh, those other hikers and the lifelong friendships that, uh, that we now have. Lolo Pass, of course, uh, and uh, Bundy's friend drove out from Spokane. Uh, every time I would go into a town, it was just always such a warm, welcoming feeling because the, the hikers would all be out on some patio at a restaurant and you, know, you don't know they're there and you're kind of walking trying to figure out you know, where you're going to try and get a motel room and just out of nowhere Roll water, right? And they do the, you know, we do that for everybody. It's that, it's that familiarity, and just, just very special thing. I have to share this story. When I get to Chester, California, which is about the halfway point, mile thirteen hundred roughly, I really wanted a haircut, and all I wanted was to get the clippers with the half inch guard, or even the quarter inch guard, and just take all of the hair off. Right? Because I'm wearing a hat and a fur I really don't care what I look like. And I went into a barber shop in Chester and I asked the barber how much to just do that over my head with the clippers for two minutes. That'll be $14. What? $14? And I started calculating it in my head and it works out to be something like over $400 an hour. And I simply wasn't going to do it out of the principle. Okay? And so I, I leave. And the next time I got to was Gunsmere, and I, I couldn't find a barber there, and so the motel I was staying at was a mile from the town. And so as I'm walking back uh, through Gunsmere, California, residential area, I'm hoping to find a lemonade stand. And that probably makes absolutely no sense to you, but here's how you start to think as a through hiker. If you can find a lemonade stand, and you befriend the young children that are trying to sell you lemonade, their parents maybe have a pair of hair clippers that you can borrow, that you can borrow for just a couple minutes, right, to do the two-minute haircut. And uh, I'm getting close to the motel, no lemonade stands. And so I'm saying, okay, well, I'm just going to have to, you know, deal with it. And as I, as I get to the motel on the left, just across the street is a table uh, maybe a four by six table with all these kinds of strange things on it, and a middle-aged guy and a young guy sitting behind it. And they kind of yell out to me, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'm a social scientist, curious. And so I, I walk over, and they've got the old rotary phone and this lamp that's made out of elk antlers, and they're trying to sell me these things. And I try to explain to them that I'm a crew hiker, and I really don't have any need for them. But I could really, really use a pair of hair clippers for about two minutes. And the middle of the says, well, why don't you come off the house and I'll see if they don't have some. And it was about an eighth of a mile up this gravel driveway to the actual home. I had the music from Deliverance coming to my mind. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I waited outside. I wasn't going to go in the house. I waited outside. And Lo and behold, he comes out with a full set of hair clippers, all the guards, we put, we put the quarter inch one. I used a window looking, you know, inside the house, but it was dark in there, so it was perfect mirror. And, you know, do it, it took longer than two minutes. It's harder than it likes to, to do that. Uh, but we got it all done, right? And he's sweeping up all the hair. And on the way up the driveway, he asked me if I was willing to pay for the service of having hair clippers, should he be able to find them. And I said, yeah, I'll give you five dollars to use your hair clippers for a couple of minutes. And as he's sweeping up all my hair that's on their porch, he asks, you know, we're really on hard times here. Uh, I, I've got the hair clippers for you. You think you could give us a little bit more? And I said, sure. And I gave him another five. So I spent ten dollars on the hair clippers, but it was not fourteen. <laughs> Like I mentioned, my favorite part of every day 
was after hiking, setting up my tent, getting inside the sleeping bag, reviewing the maps for the next day, where am I going to get water, how far am I going to try and go, where am I going to try and camp, and eating candy. I mean, it, it, it's just so weird that that became such a ritual. Uh, but it was one of my favorite parts of, of every day. Uh, and finally, being truly one with nature and the wilderness. When you spend that amount of time, and it's basically all you're doing, uh, there were many fears I had, you know, rattlesnakes in the desert, bears in the Sierra. But, but after a while of hiking, um, you felt like there was just something protecting you. And you were actually part of this environment. And you respect it, and it respects you. And uh, yeah, just, just a phenomenal feeling of being one with nature. Uh, some of the, the scariest moments. This was a, a street, a log crossing that did not work out well I, because of these um, branches. And you can see this is a waterfall here. Okay, so when I attempted to do this, it was really, it was really dumb. I should have just taken the time, taken the shoes and socks off, and, and crossed. Uh, but I overcompensated and I'm leaning on this side because if I fall, I'm certainly not wanting to fall on that side. And I ended up um, with my center of gravity a little bit too far to the right and I ended up going in. Uh, but this stream port here was a very, very scary moment. And I actually want to share with you uh, an actual entry from uh, my journal. June 11th, it rained all night and the big tree I was under is telling you so much. I felt fortunate that the rain stopped when I got up so that packing up wet was a little more tolerable. My pack is too heavy to begin with, but now even more so with everything wet. I'm on trail at 6.40 a.m., later than usual, uh, but it wasn't bad given the conditions, and one is to get another stream crossing just after a quarter of a mile. This is a raging stream, and the last thing I want to do is take off my last dry socks. The current was so strong that it was not a safe option to wade across, so my first thought was to find a way over the rain soaked rocks. Two young John Muir Trail hikers converge on the other side. The John Muir Trail and the PCT uh, share 211 miles, and the JMT goes from Yosemite to Mount Whitney. And so they converge on the other side of the stream. Uh, and while there was no way we could hear each other over the raging stream, we clearly understand our collective dilemma. There were three options, with none less dangerous than the other, and seemingly having a collective consciousness, we each choose the route we're going to take. This was not a rock hop, but a rock jump. And as I was standing on a wet rock with a major jump onto wet rocks before me, I felt an adrenaline like never before. If this jump did not go well, my PCT track could easily be over, and perhaps much worse than that. With the wet and heavy pack, I did dig deep to find the power to make this leap with the ability to recover should I slip upon landing. Something just took over at that point, and I was off. The mild tread on my shoes somehow stuck the wet rock on the bank just enough to gather myself and remain upright. I looked back to the young couple now safely on the other side, and the three of us simultaneously gave the thumbs up sign. We couldn't exchange a word due to the roar of the screen, but as a moment, and experience we will always share. That was a very special moment on trail. Uh, you can see, I'm emotional. I'm just thinking about it. Uh, the bear encounters all were courteous. I did have uh, three bears in my camp one night, and trees actually above my tent. I was still carrying my bear cancer at that time. It never uh, came near the tent, uh, but it was a bit unnerving. I heard gunshots at Agri Meadows in Yosemite. Uh, that put me on the ceiling of my tent for a couple of minutes. Uh, but other than that, uh, things went really as well as could be expected. Uh, amazingly, I had trouble sleeping. Uh, after you hike 25 miles a day, you think that that would be kind of the easiest part. Uh, but for some reason, I really had, had difficulty sleeping. Uh, going with uh, two small shoes for the 100 miles from National Crater Lake was certainly very challenging. Uh, the 150 miles from the South Sister to Mount Hood uh, with the severe shin splint and of course missing uh, my two daughters. Uh, some of the biggest surprises, some of the youngest, strongest hikers that were averaging 30 miles a day quit. They quit the trail. I mean, the, the, the people you thought would be the first to finish uh, were some of the people that got off the trail first. 
Uh, as soon as I got home, I gained weight like you wouldn't believe, and I'm struggling to, to get it back off now. And, you know, here I am, unshaven, unkempt, dirty, smelly. I've been a city administrator, I've been a college professor. I have never been treated better in my life than as a crew hiker. Uh, it, it, honestly, uh, I, mean, I mean that sincerely. Uh, that quote down there at the bottom really sums up everything. Uh, something that is kind of a mantra on trail that the trail provides. And it does. Uh, something like, a, like I said, something seemingly magic happened almost every time. Are every day. I never tried tired of my trail of food until I got home. A lot of hikers just couldn't eat, you know, something that they'd been eating for, for months. Uh, for me, it was look, it's all I got, it's perfect, right? But as soon as I got home and looked at it, it was very unappetizing. Uh, adjusting to life was very difficult. Uh, post life depression is actually very common, and I found myself slipping into a very severe form of it. Uh, early on, it was like a, a complete paralysis, and every spare moment I had, I would be back hiking uh, on trail. And there's a lot of factors that contribute to the depression. One is that when you hike 25 miles a day for five months, and then suddenly stop, you have that major endorphin crash. That's, that's the physical side of it. But the mental and emotional side is, is even more powerful, uh, because on trail, you're in a different world, and you come back into society, and you're, you're so used to dealing with the fellow through hikers and the genuineness and the authenticity uh, of those interactions. And you watch commercials for the first time in five months, or uh, you experience road rage or going the speed limit, or uh, these kinds of things. And just the common courtesy that just seems to be evaporating from our society, not to mention the marketing and the, the corporate mind manipulation, we're all very, very alienated. Uh, so post-hike depression is actually very, very common uh, for, for many reasons. Uh, so getting just into the research briefly, and then we'll open it up for questions if, if anybody would like to ask anything. Uh, every single hiker uh, that I encountered on the Pacific Crest Trail definitely felt the presence of a long-distance hiking subculture. Uh, on trail, you get to know people better in one to two days than uh, six months at home. What we're finding is that the subculture on the Appalachian Trail, where Dr. Harmon has done previous research, is actually stronger uh, than that on the PCT uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, interestingly, the AT has many more hikers than the PCT does, but the number of hikers on the PCT has increased almost exponentially over the last five years, leading to a very uh, significant dynamic. When you had a small group of 350 people hiking the PCT up, I mean, through 2000, even through 2008, um, it was very, very close-knit, like the subculture on the AT. But we now have uh, a couple thousand people trying to attempt the PCT. And those, that increase in numbers has led to a, a, a bit of a, a less cohesive subculture. Uh, also, what we're working with here is, is not just that George Zimmel uh, group dynamic, but uh, on the East Coast, things like suicide and crime and divorce are much less prevalent than they are on the West Coast. So in the Western states, we see much higher rates of suicide. And a student once asked me once, uh, is that because we have more cliffs to jump off out the rest? And uh, no, that's not accurate. There are more cliffs to jump off. That's not the reason. What we find for crime, for divorce, for suicide, is that people on the East Coast feel a much higher degree of what we call social integration, meaning that their feeling of connection to their community and society is much stronger than people feel it on the West Coast. And the reason for that is that the East Coast neighborhoods are, have been around for a lot longer, they're much more entrenched, whereas the Western states tend to be much more transient in nature. And, and this is one of the reasons why we see the subculture being uh, stronger on the uh, Appalachian Trail than on the PCT. But that's not to suggest by any means that it is not a strong subculture on the PCT as well. Uh, trail names, I mentioned, very important part of the experience. Uh, we're using Delver subcultural analysis. And in addition to looking at the social self of long distance hikers, we're also looking at the place situated self. Place identity is, is very significant. Uh, if you can think about what your home says about who you are as a person, or when people are from a particular 
uh, city or town and take great pride in that. They have that, that place situated identity with that location. And for the longest and hiking community, the long trails represent that very significant sense of place. Uh, yeah, I just mentioned that. Uh, the immersed practices and shared experiences result in this, this very strong bonding. Uh, when you go through those hurricane force winds for a couple of nights, and other people have shared in that same experience, there's this tremendous component of attraction that draws you together uh, with very strong emotional bonds. And the identity that you develop with the subculture remains with you long after the trail is over. All right, so here are some characteristics of long-distance hikers. Excessive food consumption, uh, no question. Uh, Self-discipline, perseverance, commitment, and dedication. Uh, I was up with my watch alarm at 5 o'clock in the morning every morning, and I was on trail every morning by 6 o'clock with a few exceptions. That, that's, that's dedication and commitment uh, to accomplishing your goal. Uh, unwavering trust in complete strangers. I have never hitchhiked before. It was actually something I was very anxious about, but hitchhiking is a major part of the trail because you actually must hitchhike to get into uh, certain towns uh, to resupply. Uh, chosen life of poverty, a rejection of modern day structures. A large majority of the through hikers reject a, a emphasis on materialism. Unkempt appearance leads to the stereotype of uh, through hikers being lazy. We're actually the complete opposite of lazy hiking 25 miles a day. Common language, uh, living in the moment, and one of the most common things we hear from true hikers is that they have a restored faith in humanity. You are treated so well uh, when you're on trail, and there's absolutely no way that you can uh, thank the people adequately for how they treat you, so you pay it, you give it back uh, by traveling to them yourself. Uh, let's see, uh, many hikers were in a period of transition, uh, whether it be a divorce, whether it be a career change, losing their job, or uh, be, yeah, being laid off, or uh, increasingly the younger demographic, uh, being a college graduate, right, before they start their professional career. I'd just like to share some of the interviews uh, with you, or at least excerpts from this, this is from KC. A trail name symbolizes that you are officially part of the trail and PCT community. People on trail get to know you in ways that people back home don't. The common everyday things in society aren't important on trail. We throw away the things that society deems important. Back home, when you meet someone, you introduce yourself and then immediately ask, what do you do for a living? As if we're focused on judging or ranking this person we just met to compare to where we are in society. On trail, we were all from very different backgrounds but everyone out there was on a level playing field. We were all doing the same work to get where we were going. I feel society places too much importance on your profession and how much money you make, materialistic kinds of things that really don't tell you who you truly are as a person. On trail, you get to know people more intimately in a few days than even 10 years at home. Uh, from Ladies Man, and please remind me to some of the stories for Andy Australians. Uh, what I liked most was the people. The amazing folks I met on trail. They had an amazing level of integrity and confidence, but humility at the same time. Uh, Faze, both the AT and PCT have given me nothing but love. By far my favorite thing about both trails, again, people. Both hikers and trail angels. The through hiking community is strong. We watch out for one another. And with through hikers, it's more like family than community. Uh, POD, scenery and people are a tie for her favorite thing. Both are pretty spectacular when it comes to long distance hiking. Uh, this is Roman pictured here. You're forced to live in the moment. The only planning you're doing is perhaps your next resupply. Looking out nine days, how much food do I need to get from here to there? So you live in the moment, something we don't do enough of in society. Trail names are part of having an identity outside of mainstream society, which is what the PCT is all about. I uh, cool it. When I walked into Belden today, I immediately spotted the hiker trash. Uh, all congregated in front of the store. We affectionately refer to each other as hiker trash. Uh, it's interesting because you're walking off the trail into this odd scenario. There was this huge rave music festival going on in Belden. Uh, so it's very strange to, to walk into that. But even if you're just walking into a town, you're seeking that familiarity of the other through hikers. Uh, so when you see 
uh, the club of other hikers. You know, it's not just what we look like. Absolutely, we're a subculture, like-minded, open-minded people. You instantly make friends with people you just met, even though we come from all different backgrounds. Instant connection. While out there, the trail becomes a great equalizer, and the trail name emphasizes this alternative life and experience. You become this new person on equal footing like everyone else. Your off-trail life is left behind when you become a flu hiker, and the trail name finalizes that transformation. I've, I've found it very difficult to try and adjust back in to my previous identity because I don't want to give up my new identity of who I became on trail. Uh, something the line, trail names are what the trail is all about. We all go to the trail to understand a part of ourselves, to challenge ourselves, and we all become a different version of ourselves. Uh, this is Beer Guard's picture here uh, at the Northern Terminus finishing the trail. Out of 100 people you meet on trail, you really, really like 99 of them. In the real world, maybe 5 out of 100. Many hikers are really alienated by society. Again, notice this constant theme, right? I, lo I like meeting, I love meeting the people the best. Uh, we're so distracted in the real world. When you meet people on trail, you often find that you're pondering, thinking about the same kinds of things. I'm able to think at a higher level on trail, and so are others. Uh, Beer God has actually previous hike, previously hiked the Appalachian Trail as well, and went into such severe post-hike depression that she couldn't wait to get back on another long trail. And she'll be hiking the CDT next, the Continental Wide Trail. And once the hiker has done all three, uh, that is a triple crown. New identity. Super class. I consider some of my fellow hikers to be like family. The community is a large aspect of the trail experience. I was alone virtually the entire time I did the Tahoe Rim Trail. There was only one day on this PCT hike I didn't see another person. So the community of fellow hikers is an integral part of what makes this through hike incredibly special. Cougar writes, I have definitely learned how to be more open with people, especially complete strangers, and have, had, and have allowed myself, even if it's only a 10-minute experience with that person, and I'll never see them again, to make myself open and make that connection with strangers. I agree that you get to know people out here better in two, three days than you do six months at home, and I've heard other hikers say this too, that there's not that kind of social censorship that are, exists in our regular lives. We are very open about what we eat, our bodily functions. It's just more honest, more open, more human. Many, many thanks again to Wenatchee Valley College for all of you letting me share my story with you. My daughters uh, for thinking about me while I was away. Maurice Holgallion for helping with the resupply boxes. Uh, but again, I would not have been able to live this life on the green. I had it not been uh, for Wenatchee Valley College. So my deep gratitude once again, and I'd just like to open it up to any questions you may have. Thank you folks. I know it's probably getting late for a lot of people, so please, if you have to uh, call them tonight, please don't feel sheepish about not getting out of it. Yes? Yeah, Yogi's, Yogi's PCP guidebook is an incredible resource. Uh, throughout her guidebook, she uh, has maybe 10, 15, you know, very experienced advisors who give a, a variety of their advice. Um, one piece of advice is not going to work, you know, for everyone. So she, she really does a good job in that book of providing 10 to 15 points of view. I would highly recommend that. Uh, even if you're section hiking the trail and you're a little concerned about navigation, I would also highly recommend Half Miles app, ECT application. Um, I am not a big person on technology, but I did get a breakdown and get a uh, smartphone. It actually was free with the service that I uh, subscribe to. And it was very important to do my online journal uh, with the phone. I wouldn't have been able to keep the online journal. So I hand wrote my journal every night. But then when I got to town in those seven to ten days, I would uh, transcribe my handwritten journal into the uh, memo on the phone. And then I was able to upload it to Pulsecore.com where I, I kept the journal. But the half mile app uh, on the phone is free. And it was an incredible resource because you don't have to have service 
to access that mile's path. And there are many times on trail when you're wondering, I haven't seen a market in a couple of days, am I really on trail? And you can turn the app on, whether you have service or not, and it will either tell you you're on trail and the exact mile you're at, or it will tell you you are this far in what direction off trail. And that was a very, very valuable thing, thing to have on trail. Excellent question. But I would definitely recommend uh, you like that. Thanks, Kevin. Better than the data I use both. Um, in fact, I carried the sessions of the data book, so I would uh, rip out the pages and put them in the boxes so that I would ha I didn't have to carry the whole thing. I would only carry, you know, eight, ten pages at a time. Uh, I did carry the data book, uh, but I really did not use the data book. I mean, it was, it, was, it was nice to have, but I really wasn't using it. Yeah, I really wasn't using it. I, I found Half Mile's app to be invaluable, absolutely invaluable. I used half miles paper maps as well. Okay, so I would I would use paper maps, but if I really needed to know what I was on trail, I'd check the phone. And fortunately, it didn't bleed battery. So if it was turned off, I had it off and other than when I needed it, it did not bleed. So I could charge it every seven to ten days when I got the phone. Yes, yeah, so we'll go over there and then here. Rich, uh, you went south to north. What's the percentage? I would say it's probably 80-20 or even 85-15. From south to north? The large majority of people are going south to north. If, if you hike the trail southbound, you have to start in mid-July because you're immediately getting into the North Cascades and snow. And so maybe even mid-July in a, in a average snow year could be ambitious. I mean, some people have good snow skills, but um, the other problem with going southbound is that if you don't get to the Sierra soon enough, then weather starts turning, you know, with, with the fall seasons, and you know, you're at 10,000 feet, 12,000 feet, forest are past 13,200 feet. So if you're going southbound, you have to make sure that you get through the Sierra before uh, weather gets there. Uh, certainly the large majority, I would say 80 to 85 percent of the hikers each year are going south to north. April through September is that window. Yes? On an average, how much do you pack away? Yes, a good question. You know, when you're coming out of town, uh, you're, you're probably five pounds heavier coming out of town. And then, you know, after seven days, you're down to almost no food, and so you're much lighter. I would say that my pack, I was one of the heavier packs on trail, actually. Um, I chose to use gear that I was familiar with rather than re-gearing uh, with ultralight equipment uh, just because I was familiar with it, I was comfortable with it, it, it had nostalgia for me, for me as well. Uh, but as you saw, I switched out my pack, but I didn't go with an ultralight pack, I went with, you know, a really sturdy Osprey um, Atmos 65, uh, which is a heavy pack, but it distributes the weight uh, so well, and it's sturdy. Your pack is basically your most important piece of gear, I mean, outside of shelter and sleeping bag. And so you, I wanted a sturdy pack that I knew wouldn't, wouldn't fail on me. But I would say I would be about 40 pounds leaving town, about 35 pounds getting into town. Which is heavy. Uh, some that were really on the ultralight side, I would say were even like 25 to 30 pounds. Yes? So you're saying your base weight was 30 pounds? Not the, not the base weight. Um, because that, that included water, that included food. Uh, I would say, you know, the, the kind of standard goal of your base weight for many years, probably lower now, has always been about 15 pounds. I was, I was a little higher than that. I'd say probably my base weight was probably closer to 20. What kind of stove were you using? What kind of stove? Yeah. I had an Espet stove. Did you carry it? <laughs> yeah, I had an Espet. Yeah, it was like carrying it up, you know, I used it four times. Uh, where you just put the tool tablet in this little piece of tin and then a titanium pot um, on top of that. You know, the bear can I was using was also three pounds, so that really added to, to the weight as well. And I carried it long after Yosemite. It required from Kennedy Meadows to Yosemite. I promised a ranger at the kickoff that I'd carry it the whole way. And sorry, uh, that lasted to uh, Castello, California, and I. I ended up sending it home and using an off sack, which is an odor-free or odor-proof uh, 
it's a ziplock on steroids, I guess would be the way to describe it. Yes? Uh, what was your diet like uh, during your training previous, or before you to Yeah, I, I eat relatively healthy. Um, uh, on trail, it was, it was hard because my plan was to use dehydrated food, and I wasn't sure how cold water would reconstitute the dehydrated food. It actually works fine, uh, whether you're doing mashed potatoes or even the actual Mountain House meals. If anybody's interested, uh, if you're going to get a dehydrated dinner, Mountain House Pro Pack. It has to be Pro Pack. It's the highest quality and gives you uh, the most calories and, and the protein that you need. And, and the, the taste of it, I think, is, is far superior to anything else. But not just Mountain House. It's the Mountain House Pro Pack, and they're actually vacuum pack. Uh, whenever I could, I would get salmon on trail. That wasn't always available, so I ate tuna a lot. If you eat too much tuna, there's the issue with the mercury that you, you need to decognize in them. Um, peanut butter is a staple on trail. Uh, the, the, the big bonus every night was the Snickers bar. I mean, again, you know, it's something that I never had done previously, but on trail, it was just very different. And if you're trying to get as many fat calories as you can, because your body is burning so much. So I didn't have any particular diet training-wise leading up to the hike. Uh, when I was on the hike, you know, you try and keep healthy, but at the same time, you're hiking 25 miles a day, and so you're not too concerned about it. Uh, but I think part of my weight gain since coming home was probably that I, I, I mean, if I could do it over, I would try and eat more healthy on the trip. Cut out the can at night eat as much as I liked it. Cut out the sneaker bar. No way we're cutting out the peanut butter milk. No way. <laughs> yes, we'll go there. If the young lady and then there. Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> yes. Did you ever sleep in? Did I ever sleep in? Uh, if it was a zero day, I would certainly try to sleep in. But amazingly, uh, it was very difficult for me to do that because I've just been in such a pattern. I tried. I tried to sleep in. Uh, just a couple of times. Go back there and then right here. Okay? How do you negotiate permits going from place to place to place? Is that something you can do when you get into a new park? Actually, you get one permit, which is the through light permit, and that then you're set. You're set for the entire hike. You do not need a special permit over and above that. And you can get that online through the ECTA, ECTA.org. They actually last year implemented for the first time because the movie Wild came out before uh, the 2015 season. They were really concerned about how many people were going to be starting the trail in April. So for the first time, they limited it to 50 uh, permits per day. So, you know, uh, when February, March roll around, you just want to be really watching PCTL and PCTA.org because one day that's going to be up and they're only going to allow 50 permits. And I chose the April 20th as the start of my hike because I wanted to partake in the kickoff. And so I, I had that one day of hiking to Lake Marina and then the kickoff started. So that's how I chose my perfect day. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, right here. I'm still thinking, you know, about how the trail has changed me. I'm still going through, you know, that, that entire thought process. I, mean, I, I came back and started teaching again at the beginning of this quarter, so back in January. And, and going from, you know, sabbatical to going back to fourth class of daily and being social science division chair really kind of has, you know, it was, it was a, it's been a difficult transition. So I'm still trying to process through all of those things. But as a sociologist, you know, I, I've always been uh, a very critical thinker about how our society is structured as an example. And I think the biggest emphasis that, that I can do, not just in the research, but in the book that I'll be writing long term, is that our society and the world learn so much from the long distance hiking subculture. 
And I think that's kind of where you were, you were trying to go with the question. So absolutely, and that, that, was, that was really my vision uh, early on, even before I was somehow using, being able to utilize the experience to, to improve our society. So that will be the long-term focus of the book. But the book will be a much more fun read. You know, the, we're writing the articles now. We've got a working draft uh, for the first one. This will be presented at a symbolic interaction conference in August, actually. Uh, but the book will be much more subtle sociologically and uh, much more like a walk in the woods. Those of you that have not read Bill Rice's book, Walk in the Woods, I know the movie came out. Okay, but uh, nothing can compare to that book. It is, it is, it is hilarious. Uh, laugh out loud funny, but it's also very historical, uh, very historically significant. <laughs> yes? Can I ask about the Woodpecker Martin Falls uh, Park? Oh, Woodpecker, Woodpecker was, a, was an older hiker, and uh, after I share this story, I'd just like to share a couple stories on the trail names, because I think you'll, you'll really find them in a Woodpecker was an older gentleman, and he and I, Trying to think of where we met. We met previously, but we we started the Hat Creek Rim together. And Hat Creek Rim was about 30 plus miles with no water. Okay, so very dry section of the trail. So you're actually carrying six, seven liters of water. It's very, very heavy. And uh, Woodpecker and I met the next day. Uh, and he stopped for lunch, and I stopped and talked with him. And the previous night, I had the goal of making it to Bernie Ball State Park, which was 26 miles, which I think would have been my longest uh, day uh, so far on the hike. And so that was my goal. So when I met with him at about 10, 11 in the morning, I told him I'm trying to get to Bernie Falls, and he said, hey, I'm going to try and meet you there. And um, uh, I got there, and it turned out, I didn't know this, but he actually was waiting in the lake to wash off his feet. He stepped on a thorn that just completely punctured his foot. And I didn't know that because I had left him where we stopped for lunch and I left him trying to make the reservation and make sure we were going to get a campsite at the state park. And very late that evening, in comes Woodpecker limping into my campsite. And he made it. And what was, what was so interesting was that it was so poorly marked from the trail that I actually walked a half mile beyond the state park, ran into a fellow hiker who said, no, the turnoff is back there. So I could have easily said, you know, I told Bill Pecker we were going to camp at the state park, but I'm half mile beyond and I'm just going to keep going. But I didn't. I went back the half mile, went and got the campsite, and he could have done the same thing too. He could have said, you know, I stepped on this you know, sharp thorn, my foot's bleeding, all swollen. I'm not going to make it to 26 miles today, but he did, and it was just—it was just one of those special magic moments on the trail. But yes, thank you for asking. Just like to share a couple stories of the trail names. First, liability. Liability was the youngest hiker on the trail this year. He started the trail at 17, had his birthday on the trail, but he was 17 when he got to Mount Laguna in the heavy storm uh, very early, and. The first place I went into to try and get a room, it was this store that had rooms available on the property. And the guy was the meanest, rudest person I have ever encountered in my entire life. And it was just, it was just so awful. And so I, you know, politely inquired about a room. Yeah, $9. You want it? Cool. Uh, well, I don't know. Can you do laundry? Yeah, we give you a bucket and soap. Do you want the room? It's like, and I knew there was this other place across the street that had cabins, and so I decided before, you know, offering this person uh, my business, I was going to try something, you know, the one alternative. And fortunately, I got a cabin across the street. But as hikers were coming later in the day, the rooms were filling up. Everyone was trying to get out of the storm, and liability. And this other hiker went into that store and wanted to share a room to save expense and encountered this just obnoxious owner. And he says, how old are you? 17. No, nope, can't rent the room to you. Well, why not? You're a minor. We get into a fight, I could be charged with assault. You were 18 and we got in a fight and I beat you up, it could be self-defense. Big difference. <laughs> 
So he became, he became liability. <laughs>
It was just a lot. <laughs> Clothing was optional. <laughs> uh, was there a hand? There was a hand here, and then we'll go back there. And, yeah. Actually, let's go one, two, three. So I think your hand was up a couple of times this year. Yeah, I just wondered, would you do it again? I wish I was going to have a nice one, yes. I wish I was starting the trail in April Plain. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, people have asked me, you know, if I if I you know have the ambition of completing the triple crown. When when I got to like Washington, when I got to Chinook Pass, Snoqualmie, Stevens Pass, I, I was definitely ready for the trail to be over. My my feet were just so bad at that point. And so when people first asked me, oh, are you in the triple crown? You know, First got back home, made a trip around. I said, no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. But uh, you know, like I said, then I kind of slipped into that post-night depression. Every spare moment, I would be back on the PCT. You know, just driving up to Smith Road and getting back on the trail. Even if it was just an overnight at you know Grizzly Peak or Glasses Lake or Janus or wherever, uh, I, I just couldn't be on the trail enough. I, I missed it so much, and I. I really didn't feel like I was myself at home. I felt like I was myself on the trail, and that's why I just, I just had to keep, keep going back to it. Um, the one thing about the Appalachian Trail is the humidity. That would be really tough for me. Uh, the, the, just that, that constant uh, humidity it would be really, really difficult. And the CDT isn't even complete yet. So you have 100 mile roadblocks on, on the CDT. Uh, you've got the afternoon thunderstorms, especially in the Colorado area, uh, that you have to look through, and, and navigation is much more challenging on the CBT. So, if, if I could do anything again, I think I would do the PCT. Okay, here and then, was that the order we went? I'm sorry, I completely wrong. Yeah, that's a very good question. It's, it's really, the PCT has really changed uh, demographically the last five years. Uh, to a much younger demographic. And so speaking of camping, I, I love the camaraderie and the, the community and family feel during the day, but in the evenings I really like the solitude because when you have a much younger demographic, they, a lot of people, especially early, I mean this really improved as the hike went on, but especially early, people didn't respect hiking midnight, which is when it's dark, it's black, right? I mean, the sun goes down and you're going to sleep. The sun comes up and you're up and you're, you're moving again. And the, the younger demographic didn't have that same value, especially early. Uh, and they would be staying up, you know, and being kind of loud, making it very difficult uh, for the rest of us to go to sleep. So uh, in the evenings, I tried to find solo campsites, which happened most of the time, but certainly not all the time. And there were other people that I camped with that I was very close with that respected hiker midnight. It was just that increasingly that value on the trail has, has seemingly changed. So much, much younger demographic. Yeah, I would say average age would be very difficult to, to try and pre, you know, uh, guesstimate, but certainly I would say about 75% of the hikers on the trail now are 20 to 25. Much younger demographic. Yes? How many days were you on the trail and how many zero days did you take? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because as I went on, I, I really tried to just take zero days and, and eliminate the zeros. Uh, 150 total days, and I would probably guess if I, I mean, and this is a guess, Jeanette, probably 20 zeros. And it might not have even been that much. You know, maybe 20 combined zero and zero days. Uh, but there was something I really looked forward to. You know, have, being able to just hang out in town and eat page three of the restaurant menu. <laughs> um, you know, spending time with the fellow hikers, whether you've seen them before or not, because you, you just all, you're one. Um, those, those were really special days, like that, that time in Mammoth, as an example. Yeah. I mean, I'd have to go back in the journal, I could, I could give you an you know, exact number, but I, I have to think it was probably and when I got to, when I got to the Pass, I spent a couple days certainly at home, uh, and that would contribute to the twenty as well. Any other questions? Yes, there and then here. Uh, what's the total cost? Yeah, that's and that's a great.
very good question too, and that's going to vary based on uh, how many zero days you take, right? Because uh, you know, and where you stay, right? Because you can find certainly cheaper accommodations, and, and I always try to find very modest accommodations. But when you get to Timberline Lodge, you don't have a choice if you want accommodations. Uh, but that's that's such a you know a rite of passage on trail is to stay at Timberline and, and have that buffet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was, that was definitely a must. I would say, you know, you, it, it depends too on how much gear you already have, right? If you're already completely outfitted, then you don't have the gear expense. But I would say a good general number is probably $4,000. Uh, and when you think about that, it's not that bad if you're able to, uh, you know, not pay rent while you're away. You know, I decided to bite the bullet and, and keep the rent payments going in case I had to get off trail and come home, or when I came home from trail, the last thing I wanted to do was find a new place to live. Uh, so I decided to, but you're not using power, uh, you're not using, you know, you can put your TV, phone, all those things in, in vacation mode or whatever the companies call it. So there's a lot of ways you can save money. And people like Billy go, that's what they do. They work a little bit in the, in the winter season. To raise, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars, and then 